So welcome back, everybody. I guess it's time to get started. So uh, we're in the middle of talking about graph partitioning. And here's a review of what we did last time before I pick up again. So I defined what graph partitioning was, which is you're given a bunch of vertices and edges, and you want to divide them into two groups, one group of vertices and another, where it's load balance. So each set of vert you're about an equal number of vertices in each half, or their weights add up to about the same. And you want to have as few edge crossings between the two halves as possible. That means there's as little communication as possible. So there were lots of heuristics that we talked about because finding the best way to do that is NP complete, so exponentially expensive. We don't want to do that. So there are basically two uh, categories of heuristics. One where you actually have more information. You have XY coordinates or XYZ coordinates for, for the vertices, and you just assume you're connected to your nearest neighbors in space or on the plane. And then we, we just e actually ignore the edges. We just use the XY coordinates. And we had inertial partitioning. And we uh, also had random circles or random spheres. And then we, all, we talked about um, how do you partition when you don't have XYZ, but you have the edges. And that's all you have. And the World Wide Web was one example, but there are many other graphs like that. And we had two kinds of algorithms that worked there. One was called Kernahan-Lin, and the other one was spectral. And in principle, they're both fast, but they aren't fast enough. And so that's why this next category of algorithms is going to take either of those two, depending on what you want to do. They both have their uses, Kernahan-Lin and spectral, and make them go much, much faster using a bigger idea, which is a multi-level acceleration. And that's going to show, I've labeled it as a big idea because it shows up in lots of areas in scientific computing and parallel computing. We'll do it later. It shows up in the world's fastest n-body algorithm which is fast multipole method, and it shows up in the world's fastest uh, equation solvers for certain kinds of linear equations. That's called multigrid. And so we'll see it here for the first time. And so the idea is that I want to partition that graph and an E, but it's enormous, so I can't afford to do it. So what I'm going to do is somehow find a graph that's smaller, let's say half as big, that approximates that graph in a certain way. So what it means for one discrete object, a graph, to approximate another, we'll, we'll see what that means in a moment. And then what I'll do is I'll take that much smaller problem and, and uh, partition it. And I'll use that somehow as a starting guess for my original one and take a few more steps to make it a little bit better. And we know Kernahan-Lin, for example, is good at that. It takes an approximate partitioning, makes it a little bit better. And so, so that's going to be my idea. Take a, a problem that's half as big and use that as a starting guess. But if you start enormous and only take half of it, it's still enormous. How do you solve the half enormous problem? Well, you do the same idea recursively until it gets small enough. And so here is the picture that I showed last time just to show you the, the call graph. And, and, and I'm going to fill in the details of how you do these things. So this is a recursive subroutine. It calls itself multi-level partition, calls multi-level partition. And here's a picture of the call graph. It's called a V cycle because it looks like a V. And each of these blobs represents the input of a particular subroutine, and, and the arrow indicates which subroutine calls another one. And so I start with a very big graph, and I say it's not small enough to actually you know, partition it straightforwardly. So I'm going to coarsen it. I'm going to call line 2. I don't know how to do that yet, but I'm going to call coarsen. And I'll call subroutine 2, and that will give me uh, a coarsening version. And then I will call multi-level partition on the coarse one. So I'll call go to line 3 of the code, and I get down to something that's half as big. So there's half of enormous. It's still too big. I'll do it one more time. I'll coarsen, and I'll call multi-level partition, get down to that size guy. Still too big. Coarsen, call multi-level partition. And I get that little guy at the bottom, and finally it's small enough that I execute line 1 of the code and I run directly spectral or Kernahan-Lin, and I get that partition. So there, that little jaggy black line is I've partitioned that graph into two. And now I start returning. So far, I've just been calling subroutines. Now it's time to start returning. So I return. And um, so that comes back here, and I'm at line four, and I have to expand it. So somehow, I have to take this black line and turn that into a partition of this bigger graph. And so that gives me that longer black line. But that's not quite good enough. I have to improve it a little bit. So make, maybe take a few steps of current handle in. And, that get, and so I call line 5, and I get the green line. And that's my improved partition of that graph. Then I do another return, and I pass the green line up to here. That turns into that black line of that partition. I refine it to get the green line. Return, get the black line, refine it, get the green line. And that's my final partition. And so now, obviously, to make this work, I have to tell you, how do you coarsen? How do you expand? 
and how do you improve. But if I give you those three subroutines, then everything kind of just fits into this framework. So there are two examples. One is for Kernahan Lin, and one is for spectral. And so I need some new ideas from graph theory. And so I'm going to do coarsening and expansion using an idea called maximal matchings in a graph, which I'll define in the next slide. And the improvement is precisely the Kernahan Lin I told you about before. So I'm going to define everything carefully in the next slide and then just show you a picture of how the algorithm runs because it's very intuitive. So what is a matching in a graph? So I have a bunch of vertices and I have a bunch of edges. And the matching is a subset of the edges so that no two edges share an endpoint. So I've matched a bunch of vertices. I've paired them up as many as I could. Well, that's what a maximal matching is. So that is a matching, a bunch of pairings of the vertices where I can't add any more edges. So if I add any more edges, then somebody, some vertex will be, be touched by two edges. Everybody's only allowed to be touched by at most one. So I want to just distinguish between the word maximal and the word maximum. A maximum matching would be I have as many edges as possible over all possible ways of doing it. That's a harder problem. I don't need to solve that. I just need to find one which is big enough in the sense that I can't add any more. And that turns out to be a simple greedy algorithm. I'm just going to sort of loop through all the, the vertices and just grab them one at a time. And, you know, and I'll keep doing that until I can't grab anymore. So it's really simple. And all the code is here. But let me just do the picture to show you how the algorithm runs. So the, here's the original graph. And so all I'm going to do is loop through the vertices and grab them. So first I grab vertex 1. So I start, they're all uh, labeled as unvisited. So I haven't visited anybody yet. So I grab vertex 1 and I say, OK, I haven't, haven't visited you. Do you have any neighbors that I haven't visited yet? And the answer is yes. I haven't gotten to 2 yet, so let me grab that edge. I'll just put that into my matching. And I color it red to indicate that I've matched it. So then I go into vertex 2 and I say, have I visited you yet? Yes, you just did. So done. Then I go into vertex 3 and I haven't been there yet. So I say, can I match you up with anybody? How about with 1? Nope, been there already. How about 2? Nope, been there already. 6, oh, OK, I'll grab you. So I grab that edge and, and marks that I've been to six. Then I go to four and I say, you know, do you have any neighbors? Three, nope, been there. Two, nope, been there. Uh, five, okay, I'll grab that one. And so I mark five as matched. Then I go visit five, been there. Then I go to six, been there. Then I go to seven, look around, grab nine. And finally eight is the lone guy left over at the end, so I just leave him alone. And so all of that code is right there, but it, it's pretty much that straightforward algorithm that I just did. And it, it's linear time, obviously, in the total size of the graph. So, that gets, so what do I do now that I have a maximal matching? I want to come up with a coarsening. And it's a very simple idea. So here's my graph where I've labeled all the, uh, per, the matchings are in, are in red. And all I'm going to do to get my coarse graph is replace each of these edges by a single vertex. So these guys are paired up. I'll call them a single vertex. These guys are paired up. That becomes a single vertex. That becomes a single vertex. Those become the single vertex, and then I have this loner left over. So those are the new, new vertices, and you can see they're about half as many as I started with. But now I have to put in the edges. And so the idea is very simple. If I have an edge for anybody in this, new, in this pair to that pair, I will put an edge between you know, their representative pairs in the coarsening. So I have an edge from there to there, so I need to have an edge from here to here. Now, in fact, I have two that connected, but I'll just merge them all into one because I only want to have, represent that connectivity. And remember, I can also want to preserve the edge weights because those are going to be important later because they tell me actually how much that edge costs. So here I have weight one plus weight two, so let me add them up and make it weight three. And so that's also a nice, simple, cheap thing to do to create this course and graph. And this, you can see, rep is a reasonable approximation of that guy, has, is about half as big. And, um, I think I just told you everything you need to know, but that's the code that just runs the algorithm I told you, told you about, and it's, it's, it's simple to do. So now, let me suppose that um, I have this coarse graph, and I've somehow recursively figured out how to partition it. So here is my partitioning that I got by my recursive subroutine. It's divided it into the, edge, into the nodes above the green line and below the green line. And I need to expand that to a partition of the original fine one. And I think it's pretty obvious how to do it. Everybody below the green line goes below the green line, and everybody above it goes above it. So that's also a very simple linear time thing to do. Um, and, and so that's all there is. So are there any questions about that particular algorithm? 
So let me go on to spectral bisection. And here I need another graph theory idea. And instead of uh, maximal matchings, it's going to be something called maximal independent sets. And instead of kernahan lin to do my um, improvement, I'm going to do something called Rayleigh quotient iteration, which is an, a classical algorithm from linear algebra. So what's a maximal independent set? So if I have a graph, then a maximal independent set is kind of the dual of the thing I had before. It's a subset of the vertices so that no two vertices are connected directly. So it's like taking every other edge. I'll see that in the picture in a minute. And so what is a maximal independent set? It's the same idea as before. It's an independent set, but I can't add anybody else. If I add any more vert vertices to it, there'll be an immediate neighbor of somebody who's already in the set. And so um, the greedy simple algorithm here, let me just run it on this one dimensional one. I'll look at each vertex one at a time and ask, you know, can I add you to the set? So you, and, and nobody's been visited, so everybody's fair game. So let me start over here on the left. And I say, have I seen you before? Nope. Are you connected to anybody I've seen before? Nope, you're the first one, so I'll put you in. Now I go to the next one. Are you connected to somebody I've seen before? Yeah, I've got to skip you. Now I go into the next one. Are you connected to anybody who's already in the set? Nope. So I'll add you, and I keep moving left to right, and obviously I pick every other vertex, and that gives me half of the vertices in the graph. And here is the, the code that does that. So now that I've picked every other vertex, I have to come up with Remember, I need to come up with a graph, so I need to add edges that somehow approximate the original one-dimensional chain. But, right, but so I have the, the blue vertices, and now I have to add the edges. So it's also going to be a simple, greedy kind of algorithm. So here, is, here are the blue edges that I put in. And what I'm going to do is sort of walk through it uh, one edge at a time and decide how to, how to deal with it. So, so f the first edge I look at is that one. And I say, who do you connect? Well, you connect somebody who's in my uh, independent set and somebody who isn't. So I'm going to put you guys together into my first sort of course, uh, you know, super node. So I'm going to put you guys together into one sort of uh, node in my, in my coarser graph. And I'll call you domain one. Then I lo look at the next edge and I say, who do you connect? Well, you connect somebody who's, diff who's a different member of my independent set to this super node I've just done. So I'm going to make you a new supernode, and I'm going to connect that no supernode to that supernode. Then I look at the next edge, and I say, who do you connect? And indeed, you connect somebody who I, who's not in a supernode to somebody who is. So I put you guys together. And I keep walking you know, from left to right. And when I'm done, I've created a new graph where there's one vertex for each pair. And each pair has exactly one independent vertex in it. And there's edges connecting these pairs of, of, of vertices. And so that is the simple greedy algorithm, and there's all the code that does it, but I think I've hopefully captured the, the idea. So are there any questions about that simple greedy algorithm? So the next question is, how do I take a partitioning of that coarse graph, which has presumably come from spectral bisection, so I've computed the second eigenvector of that coarse graph, and I want to use that to somehow partition the, the finer one. So what do I have? I have an eigenvector for this coarse approximation. And I want to update it to get an eigenvector of the fine, original fine mesh. So, so here's the idea. I'm going to just interpolate. So, because what I, so what's an eigenvector? It gives me a numerical value for each of these values. So I'm going to have a numerical value for d1, d2, d3, d4, and d5. And I just, so it's going to give me some sort of function, which I hope isn't too discontinuous. And I'm just going to interpolate to get the values at all the black nodes. So I'm going to say the blue nodes have values associated with them. And the black nodes are connected to some people. I'm just going to interpolate. So let me just draw a picture of that. And I'll do it for the simple one-dimensional case. So suppose I have a nine vertices all connected in a row. And what is its eigenvector? It's this, this nice, simple one I showed you a picture of it before. It goes from negative to 0 to positive. And I'm going to approximate it by taking every other vertex. I'm going to take vertex 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. And I'm going to compute its eigenvector. And, and so let, let me just make sure I explain this. So th this black line, that's for the nine, 9 points. I've just sort of, it only has values at the integers, but I've drawn a straight line in between it to, you know, just to make it look like a, a nice smooth function. So I'll do the same thing for the 5 point. I have a value there. There, 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 and there. And I'm going to just connect it by a blue, dot, blue dashed line. 
And so what I want to do is get from the blue dashed line, which is only has values at five points, to the black solid line. And so I'm just going to interpolate. So that guy is going to be the average of those two. That guy will be the average of those two. And that gives me the, the entire, that gives me now nine plus signs. Those are the, my approximate eigenvectors. And the question is, do those nine plus signs look like the black line? You know, not quite. So what's the difference? It that when I drew this eigenvector, I made it norm one. The root sum squares of the entries was one. I haven't done that yet. So let me just take these nine numbers and divide by the root sum squares, and I get the, um, the, the x's, the purple x's. And the purple x's are an excellent approximation of the original black line, as you know. So that's a very good starting guess for my eigenvector of dimension nine. So that's the starting guess, but now how do I improve it, right? Remember the Part of the algorithm said you, let me go back to it. So I just did the expansion. That was the interpolation. Now I have to iteratively improve it. So I don't have kernel handling anymore. I want to take an approximate eigenvector and improve it a little bit. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to use Rayleigh quotient iteration. And so here's the algorithm for doing Rayleigh quotient iteration. I have a starting vector, which is an approximate eigenvector. And I want to do this to, uh, several times to make it converge. And I'll show you a convergent plot in the next slide. So the first thing I do is I take that vector and get a better approximate eigenvalue. How do I do that? I do a matrix vector multiply. I take my Laplacian, my matrix, which, uh, you know, which is the, at the core of the spectral bisection, so the degrees down the diagonal and negative ones in the off diagonal. And I multiply it by that eigenvector, and then I multiply it by the eigenvector transpose. If that were a perfect eigenvector, this would be a perfect eigenvalue. It turns out if that's an approximate eigenvector, that's a good approximate eigenvalue. Then I have to get a better eigenvector. How do I do that? Well, I'd like to solve, you know, so I, what I'd like to do is find a null vector of the matrix minus its eigenvalue. So that means I do one step of what's called inverse iteration. So I need to solve a system of linear equations. That takes my old eigenvector approximation and gives me a much better eigenvector approximation. So, so this sounds like I've replaced an easy problem with a hard one, right? I was trying to optimize sparse matrix vector multiply. I said, oh, at each step I have to solve a sparse system of linear equations. Isn't that a problem? Well, how do I do that? Well, I have to approximate it. And there's an iterative algorithm that people use for this. It's called SimilQ. And what's its iterative? What's in the inner loop? Guess what? Sparse matrix vector multiply. So this is the chicken and egg problem that we had that I mentioned before. I want to optimize sparse matrix vector multiply. To do that in my inner loop, I'm actually doing a bunch of sparse matrix vector multiplies. So this is only interesting when you don't want to, well, when you're going to do your sparse matrix vector multiply, you know, many, many times. Then this will be a little bit of overhead. So, or if you're doing uh, image segmentation, then you have to do it this way, then you have no choice. So then you repeat and you do this a few times, and the question is how fast does it converge? I start with an approximate eigenvector. How many steps before I get one that's good enough? The answer is the convergence is cubic. Every time I do this, the error cubes. So 10 to the minus 1 becomes 10 to the minus 3 becomes 10 to the minus 9th. So let's just show you a picture. Here's a convergence plot. And so I have 1, 2, 3, 4 iterations, and I'm showing you the error both in the eigenvalue and the eigenvector. So the vertical axis is a log scale. And if I just look at the eigenvector error, it goes from about 10 to the minus you know, 1.3 to 10 to the minus 4. And it goes from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 12. That's you know, cubic convergence. And I don't need 12 digits for this, right? I mean, I need an approximate eigenvector. A couple of digits is fine. So this is like much faster than necessary. And then I can't get below 10 to the minus 16th because that's a round off error. So that's why it doesn't cube another time. So, but that's the basic uh, improvement. So, um, are there any questions about multi-level acceleration? Because I want to show you some data now to compare all these different techniques. So let me, uh, I'm going to show you some perhaps embarrassingly old data, but I will also give you a pointer to some very new software. So all of this is important enough that there are a lot of people who are in continuously developing very good software tools that implement all this, so you don't have to do it yourself. And so, in particular, if you want to do multi-level Kernahan Lin, which is by far the fastest, then there's packages called Metis and Parmetis. Metis is sequential. Parmetis is, guess what, it's parallel. Now, it turns out that hasn't been updated. Metis is quite up to date. Parmetis hasn't been updated for a little while. But there's another team 
in Europe, which has some competing software called Scotch for some reason. Um, uh, they've put out, they just put out their 20th version, um, 20th year in version of it, and they're proud to have 20 year old Scotch on the website. So <laughs> it's their website. And so they have different versions of that that's available. There's also a multi level spectral bisection that's available. This was first uh, invented back in 93. The package where you can download it is called Chaco. It, it's a, uh, at one of the national labs. And you can imagine all sorts of hybrids, but they've pretty much divided into these two categories. Since there is no one best, there's also a sort of a higher level package, which is kind of a wrapper for all of these. It's called Zoltan, also from Sandia National Lab. So you can sort of say, I'd like to try this one. If that one doesn't work, you can just sort of flip a switch and try the other one. And why are there so many? There's a good website here which sort of explains how to choose among them all. But let me just show you some data to sort of compare, you know, give you some performance numbers. And so this is somewhat old data, and, and you, you can look at other newer data on the web. So how do I compare, what are the metrics of success here? So one is, of course, how fast does it take? But the other one is how many edges do I cut, right? The fewer the better. So I want to measure that as well. And if you're interested in a particular application area like uh, image segmentation, then of course there's very specific metrics that come from that world. And in, in that case, I'll have to refer you to the papers by my colleague Jitendra Malik and his former graduate student who use that to do image segmentation and they have, have different metrics of success. And so, so the takeaway is that Kernahanlin is much faster than spectral bisection, but some people need to use spectral bisection because it does exactly what they want for certain applications. So let me show you some data. And so, here, so in this table, there's one row for each of a bunch of different kinds of graphs. And here's where they come from. Some of them are three-dimensional finite element meshes. Some of them are two-dimensional finite element meshes. Some of them come from um, you know, circuit design, so a 32-bit adder on, on a circuit. Uh, a highway, uh, Navier-Stokes equations, chemical engineering, you know, all sorts of different walks of life. They're all available freely on the web. And here's how many vertices they have. Back when this data was collected, these were large. Now they're tiny, but anyway, the, the data is still interesting. And here's how many edges they had. And so, and here's the output. Here's the one metric of success, which is how many edges did they have to cut to break up the, uh, the graph, not into two pieces, but into 64 pieces. So this is, you know, imagine you have a, you know, 64 processors and you want to break it up into 64 equal pieces, so you'll do uh, bisection you know, over and over again until you get to 64. So the question is, how do I look at that number and decide whether it's good or bad? So I need some expectation. And so what I can do is say, let me assume that this graph was actually a perfect two-dimensional mesh, in which case I know exactly what partitioning will look like. I can, say, and I can tell you exactly how many edges I would cut. And if it were a perfect three-dimensional mesh, I could tell you exactly the same thing. How many edges would I cut when I slice it down the middle a whole bunch of times? And so I expect it to be proportional to n to the one-half if it's a two-dimensional mesh. And since I have to do that, well, I have to go eight by eight, right? That's how I break into 64 pieces. I can add up all those edge cuts, and it turns out to 17 times n to the half. So that's going to be my number in this column to compare to what it actually does. And if I, if, if I do it for um, a three-dimensional mesh, then I will break it up into, you know, four by four by four. And I can tell you exactly how many edges will be cut then. It's, you know, proportional to end of the two-thirds uh, a whole bunch of times, so 11 times end of the two-thirds. And that's what shows up in this column. So let's just look and see what to expect. So there's how many edges I actually cut on this three-dimensional finite element mesh. And yes, it's more the right order of magnitude for what I expect for 3D. And it's a whole lot more than I'd do for 2D. So here's a 2D mesh. And it's indeed a lot closer to what I expect for a, 2D, a perfect 2D mesh than 3D, but they are both bigger, right? Because these are more complicated and this is not you know, perfect. And, you know, but it, it sort of gives you the order of magnitude of what to expect. Now the next one, it cuts a whole lot fewer. Now why is that? That's because circuits have relatively few edges in them, right? Because there are just not that many edges in your circuit. And so it only cuts 675, which is significantly less than if it were either a 2D or a 3D mesh. And, um, so, and, and the same thing is true for highways, right? Highways are not very well connected compared to meshes, and so you had to cut very few edges there compared to as though it were a 2D mesh or a 3D mesh. So that's one metric of success. And here's the other one, which is how much time it took. And same uh, number of, uh, it's the same set of graphs. And now here is the time in seconds for spectral bisection, which is an order of magnitude larger than the time it took for multi-level Kernahan-Lin. 
So the answer is, you know, only if you have a special app do you want to do the spectral bisection, and people do have special apps, so that, that's still available. But uh, obviously, Kernahan-Lynn wins by, by a large margin. Okay, so any questions about that? So as I said, this is such an important problem. There's lots of good available software, so by all means, try the software first before you reinvent. So graph partitioning is not the only story. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to have a more accurate model of what you're trying to do, which are called hypergraphs. So I want to tell you about what is beyond graph partitioning. And so what I'd like to do is to look at this, this is important, non-symmetric matrix, and say, how do I represent it as a hypergraph? So the simplest way you could imagine representing this is to have one vertex for every row, R1 through R4, one vertex for every column, C1 through C4, and an edge for every non-zero. So this bipartite graph clearly is an exact replica of this matrix. They have the same amount of information. But this can also be thought of as a hypergraph. And so this is how to think of it. Each, here there are only four vertices, one for each row. And each of these collections labeled by a column is what's called a net or a hyperedge. So R1, R2, and R3 are both all in one edge. There's one edge that connects R1, R2, and R3, and I happen to call it C3. And why is that? That's because if I look at rows 1, row 2, and row 3, they all have a non-zero in column 3. So that's, they're all shared. Okay? So this is just another sort of you know, labeling, if you like, uh, for a non-symmetric matrix to call it a hypergraph. Now I claim that if I partition this hypergraph, I get a much more accurate measure of how much communication there is than if I were to treat it as a plain old graph. So let me just do it for this example. And so here is my graph, and let's suppose I partition it into the first two rows and the second two rows. So I have four vertices that I want to partition, and I've shown it here. And what I want to do is count how much communication there is between uh, that I need to, to, how much data I have to move back and forth between this partition and this partition, say, in order to do a sparse matrix vector multiply. So partition one owns x1 and x2, partition two owns x3 and x4. How much data do they have to send back and forth? And so partition one touches hyperedge one, hyperedge two, and hyperedge three, or column one, column two, and column three. And partition two cut, touches uh, hyperedges two, three, and four. So they overlap in these two hyperedges. They overlap in column two and column three. So let's look over here. So yes, both the top half and the bottom half has something in column two, and they both have something in column three. So how much, so, if, so suppose I had this on one partition, on one processor and this on another processor, and he owned x1 and x2, and he owned x3 and x4, how much would they have to communicate? They'd only have to communicate two words, right? This guy would have to send x2 down to pro that processor, and this guy would have to send x3 up to there. Only two words are communicating, because they overlap in two hyperedges. So two is the obvious answer. So now, just to convince you that I can't do this with a graph, let me just now do graph partitioning. And so, so in this case, I'm, I still have rows one and row two, row three and row four, and I'm partitioning it in the top and the bottom half, and what does the graph look like? Well, I have something, I have row one is connected to row three, because there's something there, so I have that edge. Two is connected to four, because I have that particular entry, so I have that one. But I also have this cross edge because of those two guys. So it looks like, if I were to count the number of edge crossings, that I have one, two, three words of information have to pass back and forth. Because I've, this is obviously just an approximation of that. And one way to see that is that this is true even if this matrix were symmetric. Even if that entry were there, I would have the same graph, right? Because I, I don't care which direction the, the arrows go in. I don't care you know, if it's ij is non-zero or ji is non-zero, I get an edge. So the fact that I have a zero there, I can't take advantage of in this representation, but it does work here. So, so this is an incredibly tiny example to show you that hypergraphs count communication correctly and regular old graphs overestimate it. So how badly can I do it? So let me just do the obvious example, which is a two-dimensional mesh, and ask ourselves, um, is there a better way to partition it if I count carefully? So here is the way we've been assuming we've done it so far. Assuming you're connected to your you know, east-west, you know, your left-right and top-down neighbors. Here's the partitioning into four that we've been assuming is the right way to do it all along. 
And if I count how much communication there is, that guy has to send to him, he has to send to him, there are 64 words that have to cross. Can I do any better? And the answer is yes. There is the optimal partition. That's not intuitive, perhaps. So let's just see why that is. So the, the point is that this guy is needed by both that node and that node, right? Because he's his node's neighbor and that node's neighbor. But he only, only has to send one number over there to make both those nodes happy, right? So, and the, the hypergraph recognizes that, but the, the graph approach does not. And so how much communication is there here? I count the number of vertices along the side, and the point is that everybody there sort of sat makes two vertices happy. And the total communication goes down all the way from 64 to 58. Right? So it's not a huge jump, but I mean, it'll get bigger in a moment. But, that, so, but you can see that there is something better. So how does this uh, generalize? So here are some pictures of how you would uh, partition even larger uh, two-dimensional meshes more accurately. And asymptotically, how much of a benefit is there? If you do the counting carefully, you save 25%. So if I have an n by n mesh, uh, and it's in P by P processors, then if I just do it the obvious way, you know, with, 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 a, with, a two, with a square meshing, I have to send four times NP words, if you just do the counting. And if I do it this non-intuitive way, it's three, all right? So this tells you there's a 25% savings. Now the question is, it, is it worth it for two-dimensional meshes? I will say probably not, because now imagine you have to write the code for you know, updating all of these vertices, right? So you have to get things from this sort of irregular borders and you have to have funny loop indices to sort of update that slanted triangle. It may be that your local computations will slow down rather than operating on a nice square with just two nested loops. Um, but we'll get better performance in a moment. But, but just to let you know that graph partitioning is not the end of the story. So, so then the question is, this is the theoretical optimum. How well does the software do? So now let me take this same two-dimensional mesh and run a real graph partitioner on it, and run a real hypergraph partitioner on it, just to see how well they do. So there's what comes out of the actual software tools. So this is Metis, the, the tool I was recommending when you put in a 2D mesh, and it kind of looks like a square, but it's, you know, there's, it, Metis does not have a, you know, a special case for two-dimensional meshes. It's just running this general algorithm I told you about, you know, Kernahan, Lin, whatever, and with um, multi-level. And it, does, and it comes up with a total communication volume of 777, which is not you know, the minimal, but it's pretty close. Here is what, if you take the software called Pato, and, uh, and run, which is trying to do hypergraph partitioning, it doesn't look like those nice slanty rectangles I showed you before, but it's a little bit better. And, and so anyway, this is probably, you know, so which one is gonna run faster? It's a little bit hard to tell. So this is, uh, so, and again, as I said, there's lots of software out here to do this. So let me give you an example of a matrix where it makes a big difference. So this, these have all been symmetric matrices and we know we can't do better than, for this case, 25%. So let me take an example of a matrix which is as non-symmetric as possible. So it has, you know, where, the, where you're, just because AIJ is non-zero does not mean AJI is non-zero. So, and, and the reason I wanna pick a non-symmetric matrix is the graph model gives you an, has an edge in the graph if either of these guys is non-zero. And so, because it's an undirected graph. And so that means I get the same graph whether I use the matrix A or A plus A transpose. Because of, and this matrix could have a whole lot more non-zeros in it than A. So, the, so, the, so this is okay if you're, so, so you expect graph partitioning to be decent if you have a symmetric matrix, but if it's non-symmetric, something could go wrong. So let's try the most non-symmetric matrix we can think of, an upper triangular matrix, and see what happens. So here is, when I run graph partitioning on an upper triangular matrix, the partitioning it gives, and here's where I do hypergraph partitioning in the same dense upper triangular matrix. So here you can see that it's sort of dividing up the rows in some fairly random way. It's trying to do the load balancing, but it you know, has a 6% load imbalance, and the communication is 254. Here is kind of the obvious right way to do it, and the hypergraph partitioning does do that for you. It breaks it into two you know, dense chunks, and it's, the load imbalance is you know, negligible, and the communication is also a lot lower. So here is you know, an example where it makes a, a much bigger difference. So let me just summarize about the pros and cons of graphs and hypergraphs. 
So when the matrix is non-symmetric, as I just showed you, triangular, then um, we lose a lot of information by doing A plus A transpose. And so partitioning based on A can do a lot better. Um, even if the matrix is really symmetric, like a 2D mesh, you're connected to your four nearest neighbors, you can do a little bit better, 25%. Maybe that matters, maybe it doesn't. And there's lots and lots of tools that, can make you, uh, that, that you should use for this. And there's a nice talk on load balancing fictions, falsehoods, and fallacies that I, I invite you to look at here if you want to see more about the pros and cons. So that is the end of graph partitioning. Are there any questions? about that before I go on to the next topic, where I actually use this to solve some interesting problems. OK, so I'm going to now pick one particular algorithm or class of algorithms, I'll be rather more general by the end of this lecture. This is going to be one and a half lectures, sparse matrix vector multiply. And doing this graph partitioning was, was this is one of the problems that motivated graph partitioning, but it turns out there's an enormous design space to make this run faster, of which graph partitioning is one little piece. And there are so many different options that this is one of those algorithms for which a lot of effort has gone into automatic performance tuning. So where you automatically generate a large search space of possible ways to implement it and pick the best one. And you already had a little taste of that perhaps in your first homework assignment where we talked about how do you automatically tune uh, dense matrix matrix multiplication. This is much harder. And it, it's, it's going to be a much more interesting uh, design space. So um, I think that uh, the first homework assignment was enough motivation for automatic performance tuning that I'll give you uh, a few more pictures to show you why it's a hard problem. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack to find the best implementation. And I'll show you a bunch of results for sparse matrix kernels and, and to, to illustrate why it's hard to, to find. And so there's a project that many people have worked in this. We have too. We have a system called Optimized Sparse Kernel Interface called OSCE which has been, we released a, a number of years ago, which does do a lot of this tuning for you. And of course, OSCE is just coincidentally the name of the Cal Bear mascot. That's just coincidence, of course. And, and then we also have a new version of it, which is called POSCE, which is parallel, which uh, does a bunch of optimizations for multi-core. And it, there's a lot of ongoing work on this in possible class projects, because it's not just sparse matrix vector multiply that all of this applies to. It's for much higher level algorithms, like entire solvers need to be tuned. And so uh, if you want to hear more about this, that we have our weekly group meetings and free lunches on Wednesdays from 12 to 1.30, and so you can hear other people talk about it. So let me now go on for the motivation for automatic performance tuning, which is, uh, I think, familiar at this point. Uh, it's hard to write fast code. Ideally, you'd write it in your favorite language, like MATLAB or Python or Petsy or whatever, and get a high fraction of peak. But we know that the performance depends on all of these details, like the problem you want to solve. And now it's going to depend on matrix by matrix. Every sparse matrix is different. The architecture, the compiler. And so the question is, we can teach this in this class, how to do this performance tuning. And you did that in the first assignment. And a few people will get that benefit. But ideally, we want everybody to run fast code. So we'd like to automate it. Right? It makes your lives easier and everybody else's who doesn't want to spend all their time uh, understanding the low level details. So let me give you some examples of automatic performance tuning. And the dense basic linear algebra subroutines we've gone over before, the FEPAC project, which started here, then ATLAS, which was um, motivated by that. And that was adopted by MATLAB. And actually, MATLAB had a partially a, an economic, interesting economic motive for adopting ATLAS originally, because uh, at that time, you had to pay extra money to each vendor to get their hand-tuned laws. And so when you bought MATLAB, you'd have to go pay extra money to the vendor and then rebuild MATLAB. That was a very bad model. And so they wanted to have something free and fast to distribute with everybody. Now vendors usually supply the blahs, so it's not so much of a problem. But, and, and all of that is it's still under active development, and there's the website. Um, perhaps the area that's gotten the most attention is signal processing. So there's something called the fast Fourier transform, which is incredibly widely used. We'll have a lecture on it later in the semester. The first example of this was, the, it was a project at MIT called FFTW, which stands for the fastest Fourier transform in the West. And uh, it's their choice of a name. And, and their, that's their website. And that's also widely used. 
And that in turn motivated a bunch of people at Carnegie Mellon to say, let's not just do the FFT, but let's do the rest of signal processing, because there's so many variations on this. And now that's turned into a startup. And uh, in the meantime, there's been a lot of work in other even non-numerical problems. So for example, communication collectives, what's the right shape of the reduction tree so that MPI does its reductions and broadcasts as fast as possible. Uh, people are trying to incorporate it into compilers, and I'll have a bunch of other, uh, and there have been whole conferences on this topic. So I, and I'll have some uh, pointers to that later in, this, in, the, uh, in the lecture. So what I want to do is distinguish between what, what, how we do automatic auto-tuning for things like the blahs and FFTs and why sparse matrices are different. So what they all have in common is that I can do all of the tuning basically offline. If I know what architecture I'm on, I can take as much time as I want and uh, you know, hours or a week, try all the different possible ways of doing matrix multiplier FFT, build a library, and, you know, and then at runtime, when you know what architecture you're on and what your dimension is, you just go to the library and, and grab the right, uh, right implementation. Right? So the point is it can all be done offline. And the reason you might want to do it offline is that the, uh, the problem of looking for all the right implementation is a needle in a haystack. And so let me just remind you of this picture, which I think I've shown you before. Here's a little slice of the design space on this old 333 megahertz processor of how fast matrix multiply goes as a function of the two smallest block sizes in the algorithm. So it's doing an M0 by K0 by M0 matrix multiply in the innermost loop. This is on a platform which only has 16 registers, so this is the register blocking. So it makes no sense to consider any block sizes that require more than 16 registers. So that means N0 times M0 is less than or equal to 16, so I'm below that hyperbola. And so each one of these little squares represents a particular implementation. And so, and it's color coded by how fast they went. So blue is slow and red is fast, and the winner is 3 by 2. And so that means 3 by 2 blocks are going at around 600 megaflops as opposed to some of the others which are going around 100. And so why is 2 by 3 the winner? Well, as you know, it's a complicated function of the source code and the compiler and the optimizations and the architecture that you choose. And so uh, this is something that, that you, you know, really want to automate. So here's another aspect of the automation, which is um, no one best uh, implementation of matrix multiply may be best for all different dimensions. So here's another example of some data where I'm doing, I have three different algorithms represented by the blue, the red, and the green dots. And, I, and here I'm showing you which one is the fastest when I'm doing an M by K by N matrix multiply, and I'm choosing M and N equal, right? So it's I'm multiplying ma you know, rectangular matrices that are transposes of one another. And so out here the blue algorithm wins, here the red algorithm wins, and here the green algorithm wins. So how do I quickly decide at runtime when the user finally tells me what M, N, and K are, which one of these algorithms to choose? Well, this turns into a machine learning problem. And so you can use something called a support vector machine to do this. And here's just an, another example. I'm giving you sort of a tour of the techniques people use. So here is what the support vector machine says which algorithm to use. And here is what reality says the best algorithm to use. So let me just toggle back and forth and ask how well does it do? And so, does it change? There are a few changes, like that little red dot, which was fastest for real, is green. So what a support vector machine does is it takes a cloud of data like this and figures out how to draw curves to indicate, you know, the borders between the different regions. And so it, oops, sorry. So it occasionally predicts wrong near the borders, but it does a very good job in general. And so if it does do a misprediction, that's probably because the performance was about equal between the red and the, and the blue there. So it doesn't matter if it picks red or blue. So, so this is yet another technique that people use. And so I just want to say that you know, a lot of work is continuing in this, and I, I won't have time to talk about it all. Uh, here's an old paper which illustrated the support vector machines work in a, in a PhD thesis that was done here before. But there's a lot more recent references and so here are just some from the last couple of years where people have been using a lot of machine learning techniques in order to try to pick the fastest algorithm. And some of these are being incorporated in a public domain auto-tuning system called OpenTuner, which is being released by MIT. Okay, so that's what it takes to do offline tuning, when you can spend as much time as you want to do all the machine learning and, and search offline. But we have a harder problem. Sparse matrix vector multiply is going to be harder than this. 
And that's because we can't always do offline tuning. We can't afford to take all that time to figure out everything ahead of time because it may be that the algorithm and the implementation depend on the data that you only know at runtime. So in fact, it's not until the user calls SPMV that you know what the sparse matrix non-zero pattern is typically in the code, and it's only then do you have enough information to pick the best algorithm. And so what are you going to do about it? So let me just show, so what we have to do is maybe we can do a little bit offline to, to come up with a short list of choices, but then we have to very quickly at runtime pick which of this big list is the right one to use. So let me give you some pictures of what uh, some sparse matrices look like and why they're all different. So here is a sparse matrix that uh, a collaborator gave us. It, it was, they were trying to design a new particle accelerator, a linear accelerator, so this represents the physics in that. Here's another one from linear programming. So this is the first 20,000 columns of a 4,000 by 1 million matrix. So representing some sort of, I think, a railway system and con connectivity in that. And here's a matrix that uh, everybody uses every day, billions of people. In fact, you may be using it right now if you're not paying attention. Uh, so what, what matrix do you think it is? It's a web matrix, you're right. This is what Google has used traditionally to do searching. So there's one row for, and one column for every website, and a non-zero if there's a link from website I to website J. And so, and their classical algorithm, which got them started, you know, did a lot of sparse matrix vector multiplies with this matrix in order to, uh, you know, help do Google's, Google search. So, so let me remind you now, what is the baseline algorithm, and which we have to improve, uh, but this is the starting point. For, for all of these sparse matrix vector multiplies. And so here's my sparse matrix where I've color coded, you know, the, the colored entries are the non-zeros, the whites are the zeros, and I neither want to store nor compute with them. And so what I'm gonna do is just pack all the non-zeros together row by row, it's called comparse, compressed sparse row. So these four non-zeros in row one go first, then the three non-zeros in row two. I have to remember what columns they're in. So I have another array of what columns. So one, two, five, one, two, five, store those. And finally, I need one more array to keep track of where the rows begin and end. So I have a pointer to the beginning of each row and then one guy at the end. And so what I need to do is just do arithmetic on these non-zeros. So I want to do all of these dot products. So for all the non-zero entries of, of AIJ, I want to execute that line of code. So for each row, I'll you know, iterate over all the rows. I'll, then I'll iterate over all the non-zeros in that row, go from there to there, and I'll do the dot product. I'll grab the non-zero value of the, of the matrix. Then I have to get the right value of x to multiply it by. And to do that, I have a level of indirection, right? Because I have to get that number and look it up somewhere where it lives in cache or in memory. And that's going to cost you know, extra stuff that, I, that, I, that is expensive. So the question is, how am I going to, what are the tuning opportunities? What, are, you know, how can I make that possibly go faster? If I just do it the way it looks here, it's clearly going to be memory bound. I'm going to, for every number that I read in, I'm going to get to do two floating point operations. And so what I'd like to do is, is minimize memory traffic. So let me get, look in some detail at one matrix and just think about what the tuning oper opportunities are to sort of minimize the memory traffic. So here is a, uh, not such a big matrix, 20,000 by 20,000. It comes from a finite element problem from NASA. And so this is, it's a little hard to tell what's going on. So let me zoom into the upper corner and see if there's any obvious structure that I could take advantage of. So here is the top corner. And since it's a finite element matrix, if, if you've studied that before, it's no surprise that there are lots of little dense matrices in this big sparse matrix. They happen to be eight by eight. And so there's a natural uh, opportunity here, which is if, my, if I use that old data structure I just showed you, I'd have to store the column index for all of those 64 numbers, right, in that block. That seems like a waste, right? If I know where the top corner is, I know where everybody else is. There's no reason that I need to store all that index information. So let's just think about what that's going to do to my algorithm and my data structure. So as I said, I'm only going to do two flops per non-zero in the matrix. But let me say that instead of storing that matrix one entry at a time, let me store it in blocks. And just to be more general, that guy had eight by eight blocks, but I could have R by C blocks. And so for each R by C block, I'm gonna store it as a dense matrix. And all I need to do is have the location of the top uh, left corner. That's gonna drop my storage uh, by a factor of up to two. 
if R times C is, is very big, and it's all 32-bit quantities, or all 64-bit quantities, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have one index for a big R by C block, and so maybe I'm gonna cut the memory traffic in half. And so, my data structure and algorithm, I'm gonna have to pick, when somebody hands me that matrix, I'm gonna have to pick R and C, and if there it was kind of obvious by the eyeball that eight by eight seemed like a good idea, and so, and I have to change the algorithm. So it seems like eight by eight is a good idea, but let me just do the experiment, see what happens. And while I'm at it, let me not just do eight by eight, but it's pretty obvious that I could also do four four by four blocks or two four by eight blocks. I mean, I have all these different possibilities, right? So let me just try all of them. And so, in fact, I can do 16 different experiments with that matrix, because I can have one, two, four, or eight for the row block size, and one, two, four, or eight for the column block size. So let me just do all 16 experiments and see what happens. So here is a, uh, a heat plot of the speed ups I get from all of those 16 possible different algorithms. And, it, and the numbers indicate how much faster do they go than the reference code. So this is the one by one CSR, and it's going at speed one. And there's the eight by eight block, and indeed it's going 55%, you know, 1.55 times faster. But that's not the best thing to do. The best thing to do is four by two blocks. It's going four times faster. Why? Well, I don't know. Uh, it's the same issue, right? It depends on the compiler and you know, the AVX, whether you're using AVX or SSE, you know, and, and the optimizations, all of that. And the point is, I would like the system to simply discover that four by two is the right way to store that matrix and, um, and, and, and do that for me. So here is an example of what we can do offline. This is the kind of information that I can collect offline so when I see my sparse matrix, and I can see that it has eight by eight blocks, I can just look up in this table of numbers and see what the right thing to do is. But of course, you know, eight by eight isn't the only thing. What I need to do is collect data like this. So what, I'm, what I do is I take a dense matrix, which I can obviously uh, block in any way I like, and block it in all the different possible sizes where the rows go from one through 12 and the columns go from one through 12. So I do R by C from one by one up to 12 by 12 and I benchmark it. And this picture shows me how fast, much faster it goes than the one by one version for all the different block sizes. So there's what I saw before. That's the four by two block. That was a speed up of four. And here are all the other sizes. So what I have to do when I get my matrix at runtime is somehow ask, you know, what are the good block sizes? How do I figure that out? That'll come later. Then I look up in this table of, of 12 by 12 table and I say, which are the right speeds to go at? Now, and, and that's something I can do offline. So the interesting thing, thing about this table is, is that it depends very much on what platform you're on. So let me just show you some pictures because every computer is gonna be different. So here, are, so here is the uh, data I just showed you. That was the Itanium 2. Here's the Itanium 1. It looks completely different. And the thing is these are the sort of the same you know, architecture roughly and they're different just generations and it, these pictures change completely. So there's Power 3 and Power 4 from IBM. And again, uh, big differences from one generation to the next. And this is just sort of eye candy, but here's what happens when I collect the 12 by 12 data for all those four platforms, and they all look really different, right? So this is the kind of data we're gonna collect offline and use, you know, for every different architecture and use at runtime in order to do our, our uh, you know, decision making. And just for fun, let me just show you another picture, right? So it's, it's fun to make these pictures. Okay, so now let's suppose I've collected that. Is that all I need to know? Let me show you another challenge. And so, uh, because it's not, every matrix doesn't come with obvious block sizes in it, eight by eight blocks or whatever. So let's just look and see what happens. So here's another um, uh, matrix. This is a finite element fluid flow matrix. And let me again zoom into the upper corner to see what kind of blocks I can find. And here's what it looks like. And uh, it doesn't have any, I mean it has blocks, but what, there's no one size that leaps out at you. But it's, you know, three by three is not bad. So here I've superimposed a three by three grid on it in order to say, you know, what would happen? Now, if I did block the matrix this way, what would that mean for my data structure? So up here, I would store that as a dense three by three block, and that means I'd have to fill in those two blanks with explicit zeros. And not only that, would I, you know, have extra storage there, but I'd be doing explicit arithmetic with zeros. And if I go down to uh, that guy, there's one non-zero in it, so I'd be filling in eight zeros and doing arithmetic with them. And so that's what it would look like, right? There are all the reds or all the non-zeros I would fill in with explicit zeros. And it turns out the fill ratio is 1.5. I've added another 50% to the, 
to the data structure, and I've added 50% to uh, the amount of arithmetic I have to do. So do you think that's a good idea? It's a great idea. I go one and a half times faster. And the reason is that the actual megaflop rate is 1.5 squared times faster. So the inner loop, all that arithmetic, all, everything else is going 2.25 times faster, but you know, I'm, doing, I'm wasting time, of course, on that 50% extra zero, so the actual megaflop rate, if I, throw, if I don't count the arithmetic with zeros, it's, you know, I'm actually going one and a half times faster. So the question is, how do I make that decision? Uh, you know, because that's not an intuitive thing, right? I mean, you can't afford to eyeball it, right? We want the computer to do this for you automatically. So here's the, uh, the trick. So what I'm going to do is to select the, my block size is that offline I'm going to compute that 12 by 12 table that I showed you. I'll call that uh, matrix uh, megaflops as a function of rows and columns. So that I can spend as much time as I want doing. And then at runtime, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sample my matrix statistically. I'm not going to look at the whole matrix. I'm going to look at little pieces of it and say, well, if I were to block you in R by C blocks, how much extra space would I take up? What would the fill be? So if fill is 1, that means I wouldn't create any new explicit zeros. But if fill were 1.5, like in that old matrix, that means I'd have 50% extra explicit zeros stored. So then, once I do that, how do I actually pick the best value of R and C? I'm going to have this simple heuristic model. I'll take the fill, the total number of, of you know, numbers treated as non-zeros, divided by the megaflop rate, and that'll give me the estimate of the time. And I'll choose R and C to minimize that ratio, to minimize the estimated time. So, I, and I'll show you how well that works in a moment. But how do I do this runtime search? How do I uh, sample the matrix? So here is just a picture of how that works. So I'm going to pick some number, a fraction of the matrix to sample. So I'll take a block here and a block there. I have to pick you know, blocks of some size. And so the cost is going to be that fraction of the total number of non-zeros. And I'm going to control the cost by controlling S. So S is a runtime parameter. So the question is, how do I choose S to have a trustworthy estimate of how much it fills in? So what I can do is there's a statistical technique where I can uh, vary the value of S a little bit. And if my estimate doesn't change very much, then it's trustworthy. Right? So I just sort of monitor the variance as I vary S and start small, increase it a little bit. And if it seems to be converging to the same estimates of, of, of fill-in, I say, good, I'm done. So, so that's, you know, it's, in, uh, you know imp it's empirical, it's intuitive, but that's, that's the technique we're going to use. So how much does all this cost, right, because it's not free? Well, uh, it costs 1 to 11 sparse matrix vector multiplies to run this heuristic. So all of this sampling and stuff costs you 1 to 11 sparse matrix vector multiplies. So if you're only going to do one, spar if your goal is to do one sparse matrix vector multiply, this is clearly not worth it, right? Because the overhead is 11 or so to begin with. But that's not the really expensive part. The really expensive part is even if I gave you the optimal R and C, you have to convert the data format. You have to copy the matrix from CSR to the optimal one. And that mere act of copying costs from 50 to 40 sparse matrix vector multiplies. So, so there is the overhead. And so what that means is maybe once you know what the optimal R and C is, and you're going to run the same code tomorrow, just build the matrix you know, using the best R and C differently tomorrow. Or you know, spend the overhead, and, you know, depending on how many you want to do. So let's do some experiments and see how much this pays off. And so what I'm going to do is run this algorithm to choose the optimal block size on 40 or so different matrices and uh, sorted from left to right. And so the horizontal axis are different sparse matrices. The vertical axis is the performance and megaflop, so up is good. And here is the reference implementation if you just use CSR. It's getting you know, between two and 300 megaflops. And here is the best. If I try all 144 different ways of doing the blocking, how fast does it go? I mean, that's the, you know, the too expensive way to do it. And so what matrices am I trying? Well, I'm trying a dense matrix. We always do a dense matrix because we should do very well on it. And it indeed goes the fastest. These are all finite element matrices with a common block size. So you know, it's all 8 by 8 blocks or 3 by 3s or 6 by 6s. The next group are finite element matrices, but they have more than one block size. And that's not uncommon in the finite element world. You know, some two different materials with different models. But there's no one block size that works. Here's a bunch of others that are kind of hard to classify. And here are linear programming matrices, which are very long and skinny, like that railway matrix I showed you before. They're sort of the hardest to do. 
And so, and I should also say that when I'm counting performance, I'm being fair, I'm not counting flops on zeros. I'm just doing the non-zero flops, so it's, so it's a fair comparison. So, so this is the best I could do if I did exhaustive search in all 144. So the question is, how well does my heuristic do? There's the heuristic. So the little green boxes tell me how much my cheap way of choosing the algorithm works. And most of the time, it's dead on. Um, the heuristic tells me exactly what the right thing is. And there are a few cases where it's not quite so good, but you know, it's OK. So um, and oops, and I've also just thrown in uh, how fast can I possibly go doing dense matrix vector multiply, right? Because that's going to be an upper bound. And if I, if I have a perfectly dense matrix and I can store it any way I like, then that's going to be an upper bound for any of this. And that's the Blas, routine, Blas 2 routine, DGEMV. And you can see I get you know, not so far off from that. In fact, treating a dense matrix as sparse, I'm pretty close. So that's going to be an upper bound. Now, what I actually want to do is, is do a different upper bound. So that's the next step. I'm going to actually ask myself, what is the hardware doing? How much data is it actually moving you know, between cache and memory in L1 and L2? And am I close to an upper bound given that much more detailed information about what's going on? So what I want to do is write down a performance model which takes the actual data movement into account and then plot that on top of this. So here's going to be my performance model of what the hardware can actually accomplish. So I'm going to do the flop counts. And I'm, I'm going to be fair. I'm not going to count the arithmetic on the zeros. And here's how I'm going to get a, a lower bound on the time, which is an upper bound on the speed. I'm going to only count the memory operations. I'm going to ignore the arithmetic. And I'm only going to count um, the compulsory misses. So that means I have to read in the matrix, and I have to read in the vectors. I'm going to assume that there's no conflicts. Remember, a cache conflict is where I try to store two things in the same place, and one of them has to get thrown out. So to get an upper bound on performance, I'll assume that doesn't happen. My, my cache is smart enough. I'm going to take into account line sizes. So I'm, this is going to be a detailed model. And I'm going to account you know, for the matrix size and so forth. So here's going to be my performance model. I'm going to count how many L1 hits there are, L2 hits, you know, L3 in memory, you know, all the different layers. And so, so that's, you know, and, and for each of those, I will have a hardware performance number, which is how much does it cost to get something out of L1? That'll be alpha 1. How much time does it take something out of, L2, out of L2? That's alpha 2. And I'll just take this simple linear combination and going all the way to main memory. So that's going to be my performance model. And so let me now use that performance model. Well, so let me first evaluate, is this a reasonable assumption that ignoring conflicts is a good idea? So let me now plot what my model says versus what I actually measure using hardware performance monitors. So I, using PAPI, I can actually count how many L1 misses and L2 misses there were. So let me just plot that and see if this model's a good one. So here are my 40-odd matrices in the same order. And on the uh, vertical axis, is, it's the number of L2 misses uh, per non-zero. So it's sort of scaled. And it's, on, it's on a log scale. And I have, two different, I have three different things here. I have the actual number of L2 misses. Those are the green dots. I have the lower bound on how many L2 misses there, there are, assuming there are no conflicts, right? Everything is perfect, assuming the cache is as smart as possible. And they're almost on top of one another. And so that's assumed, yeah, so once I read X1 into memory, it's into cache, L2, it stays there. And then the blue is sort of the pessimistic version of doing it. That's assuming that whenever I get X sub 1, X sub 2, it misses, that it's been thrown out. And you can see that's you know, an order of magnitude more. So whereas assuming that the cache is incredibly smart is almost dead on, it isn't quite so good out there. But it tells me that you know, this, it's a decent model to assume the cache is being perfect. So let me now go back to my data and use my model here and, and compare it with how, what fraction of that I'm getting. So here is the data again if I just use CSR. So no optimization. And vertical axis is megaflop, so up is good. Here's my upper bound on how fast I can possibly go using that model. Um, so I can actually refine that upper bound a little bit by using PAPI to count the actual number of L1 misses, L2 misses, and so forth. So, uh, and that's the upper bound that I get on speed. And finally, just to remind you, here's the actual performance. Those were the, the values I got from tuning. And you can see that, well, you know, do I declare victory? You know, ideally, these green dots would be on top of the pink line. 
uh, they're anywhere from two thirds to you know eighty percent, and so I'm not doing badly. You know, you, you sh it seems like I'm getting a decent fraction of what the machine will permit me to do if my goal is to optimize a single sparse matrix vector multiply with one of these different types of matrices. So, um, any questions about this sort of metric of of success? So I've spent a long time on talking about. Uh, one optimization called register blocking, it's the first of many. There are a lot of these different things, which is why we want auto-tuning, right? I mean, we want auto-tuning for that thing I was just telling you about to search all those 144 possibilities, but there's a lot of other optimizations that happen too. And so let me just try to summarize them here. So I've been just talking about register blocking, that's the first one, and that got us up to 4x. But um, if your matrix doesn't have just one block size in it, like just eight by eight, Maybe what you want to do is split into two matrices and use one block size for one part and another block size for another part. That's called variable block splitting. And, and that's very common in the finite element world. That can get you another factor of 1.8 over, over doing it just by picking a single block size. Now some matrices don't have blocks, but they have other regularity in their structure. And if you remember when I drew the pictures of Laplacians in the natural order, there were all these diagonals. And there are a lot of matrices that are naturally stored with lots of dense diagonals. And there's some case, but, but they're just one by one diagonals, so there's no block sizes in them. But if you use a data structure where you store those diagonals and you know they're the diagonals, you can get a factor of up to 2x over just doing CSR. Now, um, I'll show you pictures of this later. You may have a matrix which is, doesn't have very many dense blocks in it, but suppose I reorder the rows and columns. That's, that's what graph partitioning does, for example. Suppose that I choose to reorder them so that I push all the non-zeros closer together. I can create dense blocks where they weren't there before. Now, of course, that's going to change your higher level algorithm a little bit, because I've reordered your matrix, but we can deal with that. And that gives you another factor of two, possibly, uh, by uh, taking the matrix and breaking it up into, uh, into, and reordering the rows and columns. I'll show you a picture. Another obvious example is symmetry. If your matrix is you know, if A equals A transpose, you only have to store half of it. And you'd think that would give, only give you a factor of 2. Well, it actually can give you up to a factor of 2.8, because you have different block size choices to make. So in addition to blocking just at you know, the R by C level, we have many levels of memory hierarchy. So I could also imagine blocking at a higher level. And in particular, when you have those uh, linear programming matrices, which had very many columns and just a few rows, you can get up to a factor of 2.8 speed up there uh, by breaking it up so that your whole vector x stays in cache. Otherwise, it won't. And the other kind of obvious sort of matrix multiply-like optimization is that in some algorithms, you just don't want to do a single a times x. You want to multiply a times many x's at the same time. And in that case, it's pretty natural. You get to reuse the matrix for each, for each of the x's. And there, if you multiply by enough of them, you can get a 7x speed up. And so, and of course, all of these can be combined in arbitrary numbers of ways. And what's the best way to combine them? Well, that's what auto-tuning is for, so we don't have to do that all by hand. Yes? So it seems like this whole slide is about blocks optimization. So far. Uh, does this mean, or what's typical of... Uh, well, actually, microphone. Good point. So I was saying, uh, it seems like this slide is about blocks operations, and I was curious if people, like something like UMF pack, uh, they just... They, they focus on getting BLOSS right, and then they just you know, pass it along to something like LATPAC and let so so let so, so, uh, so the question is, is optimizing the BLOSS enough? And the answer is no. And, and so um, one ex illustration of that is in my dense linear algebra lectures. I said that if you just do LATPAC using optimized BLOSS, does that minimize communication? And the answer was no. There was a completely different set of algorithms where you had to optimize the higher level algorithm and then you could go significantly faster. It, that turns out to be true in the sparse matrix case too. And let me just finish the slide and I'll answer that question <laughs> in a little more detail. So uh, in addition to sparse matrix vector multiply, you can also optimize triangular solve, but that, that's also a single BLAS2 operation. There's a factor of 1.8, but it turns out the real payoff is going higher level to not optimize a single sparse matrix vector multiply because you're still limited to two flops per matrix entry, right? You're going to be memory, memory bound in some sense. It's to go up and ask yourself, well, am I really just doing a single sparse matrix vector multiply or am I doing something bigger? So, so here's the simplest example. Suppose I want to um, find the singular value decomposition. It turns out 
the inner loop is you're multiplying not just by a, you're multiplying a times a transpose times x. You're using a twice in the same call. Now you could do that by a call to two sparse matrix ve vector multiplies, but if you combine this, you can read a from memory once and do all those flops. So you can do twice as many flops from memory reference. And it turns out that the big benefits are coming not just from doing a times x, but doing a, a squared, a cubed, up to a to the k times x. And to, now that gives you a, a completely different set of vectors than a normal, let's say, conjugate gradient algorithm would do. But it turns out you can reorganize the entire higher level solver, like conjugate gradients or Lanchos or GMRES, to use this kernel and go much, much faster. So what it, it turns out that what we have to do is optimize, just as we did in the dense case, in the sparse case, we have to look higher in the algorithm and completely change it so we can get more data reuse. And I will get there, probably not in today's lecture, but in the continuations next time about what those algorithms look like. Okay? But let me, let me continue with some of these pictures. So uh, let me do sparse triangular solve next and just give you a picture. So what is the uh, opportunity here? If somebody hands you a sparse matrix and you run Gaussian elimination on it using some solver, then you get an LU factorization. They're sparse. But the point is they're much denser than the original matrix because whenever you add multiples of one row to the next row, it keeps filling in. And no surprise, it gets denser and denser the farther you go down to the bottom. And so it makes sense to completely switch your data structure by the time you get to the bottom and just treat it as a dense matrix. So for this particular example, which is you know, 20,000 by 20,000 matrix, by the time I get down to this bottom corner, 20% of all the non-zeros are in there. So I should just treat that as a, as a dense triangular solve. And that gives you a, a, a significant speed up, up, up to a factor of 1.8. In fact, for a lot of matrices, as much as 90% of the non-zeros can be in that little dense corner. So you might as well you know, treat, treat it that way. So here is another example where I want to do A times A transpose. And I want to do that and only read A from memory once. So I'm going to do twice as many floating point operations for the exact same cost. So let me just do the algebra and write A times A transpose in this way. And it's just going to be, I'm just going to use associativity. So um, let me think of A as all its columns. So little a1, little a2 are the columns of A. And so they're the rows of A transpose. And so let me just reorganize it so it looks like this. So what am I going to do? I'm going to read in little a1, the first column, and I'm going to do a dot product, right? So that's the first operation. Then I'll take that scalar and multiply it by the same column. So I'll, I'll do an axb. So I'm going to use that matrix A while it's in fast memory twice. And so that's the optimization. And I will use, you know, I will do twice as many flops as I normally would be able to if I called A transpose as a separate sparse matrix vector multiply from A. Now, to, do, to make this work, if I'm if this is not, you know, if I'm storing my matrix using R by C blocks, I have to be a little bit careful about, you know, how to organize this algebra, but that's certainly possible. So let me give you a picture of that, in fact. So suppose I want to combine these optimizations, which is what the auto-tuner is going to do for you. So let's suppose I have register blocking, symmetry, so my matrix is symmetric, and I want to multiply by K vectors. So my, uh, my vector X becomes uh, K vectors, and I've written it here on its side. So I want to do A times X equals Y. And so I need to choose a block size, R by C. And of course, its transpose size is going to be down here. And I need to multiply that by a certain number of columns of x at a, at a time. So there's another parameter, v. So I now have three parameters. I have R and C. And I have v, which is how many columns do I multiply by to get the most reuse. So the question is, how do I tune that? And so here's some data that was in a, a master's thesis. So let me just show you how, much, how these optimizations combine. So let's suppose I take advantage of symmetry, and I do the blocking, but I only do one vector, right? How much faster can I go than if I just ignore the symmetry, but I do blocking, so I still choose an R and C, uh, one vector, I can get a factor of 2.6, right? So, so there's a speed up. So now, let me suppose that I do symmetry and blocking, and I take K vectors into account. What kind of speed ups can I get? Well, if I do blocking and K vectors, but I ignore the symmetry, I can go, two point, you know, I'm 2.1 better than that. And the best speed up, of course, is if I ignore all the structures. So non-symmetric, non-blocked, one vector, you know, the most basic thing, then I'm going 7.3 times faster. And there's a big savings in storage, too. So, so these are the kinds of optimizations you need to combine. So you get this combinatorial explosion of possibilities, which is why you want the auto-tuner to search over all these possibilities. So um, just to sort of 
you know, rise up a level here for a moment. Why am I, you know, haranguing you so much about sparse matrix vector multiply? And then it's because it's part of that sparse motif. You remember I said there was dense, sparse, you know, um, uh, grid operations, all that sort of stuff. And it sort of comes up everywhere. And so um, let me just remind you what's in that sparse motif a little bit. So there's both direct solvers and iterative solvers. And for the uh, direct solvers, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that, but I do want to give you a pointer to the place to go to find all the software because you know, I can't fit it all into one semester. And so here is a wonderful website which is updated every six months, which uh, what it has is the tables of where to find all the best software for direct solvers. So this is Gaussian elimination and least squares for sparse matrices. So depending on whether you're, uh, you want the best sequential or multi-core or distributed memory op uh, implementation, and depending on whether you're doing you know, LU or Koleski or something or, or, or QR, this table in this uh, website will give you the right pointer to it. And what I'm spending my time on uh, in this lecture and the next one is more about iterative solvers, just because I have to pick some subset of this to do. So this is, again, for solving AX equal B, iterative solvers like conjugate gradient, least squares also, uh, eigenvalue problems, and the singular value decomposition. And so how do you decide which of these to use? It's basically if, if your matrix is so big that the only thing you can afford to do is sparse matrix vector multiply, then you're going to be using one of these algorithms, they're called Krilov subspace methods, that all they do is sparse matrix vector multiply. And there's a lot of online material to help you choose the best algorithm there too, so you don't have to do it all yourself. And so for linear systems, here's a website with a book that we, a bunch of us colleagues wrote a number of years ago, which has a decision tree in it. I'll show you the picture on the next slide. So it asks a bunch of questions about your matrix, and depending on the answers, it'll tell you exactly which algorithm to use. And there's a similar book for eigenvalue problems. Again, there's decision trees in there that show you what to do. Now, some of you have heard about multigrid, and that's an even better way to solve a certain class of sparse uh, AX equal B problems, and I'll have a, a separate lecture on that later. But let me show you about the, uh, what the decision tree looks like, one of the decision trees. So the first question you should always ask about your matrix is, is it symmetric or not? And the answer could be yes or no. So let's suppose the answer is yes. The next obvious question is, is it a positive definite matrix? Or, well, definite matrix. And are all the eigenvalues have the same sign? And uh, that comes up a lot. So let's just suppose you say yes. And now I'm going to ask a very partic particular question. Um, do you happen to know the largest and smallest eigenvalues, or approximately what they are? You know, depending on your application, you may or may not. The, it's unlikely that you do, but in case you did, I'd have a really good algorithm for you. Otherwise, the answer is just try conjugate gradient. That's the right thing to do. Now, at the other extreme, if your matrix is non-symmetric and you don't have A transpose available, maybe you only have a black box that multiplies by A, you can't actually get your hands on A transpose. And um, if storage is not so expensive, so you can afford to keep a bunch of intermediate vectors, then the algorithm to do is GM rays. And I'll probably say a little bit more about that next time, what that algorithm looks like and how to optimize it. So uh, next time, what I will do is go back and say, how do I optimize these higher level algorithms? And so in that case, the inner, where I'm not just optimizing AX, you know, sparse matrix vector multiply, it's higher level things, and I will get asymptotically speed up improvements over just a single sparse matrix vector multiply. So we'll stop there.